Well, joining me to discuss all of this from the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, Carol Turner in the studio. Also joined by former Major General of the British Armed Forces, Tim Cross, down the line. And in New York, we're joined by theoretical physicist, Michio Kaku. Um, Mr. Kaku, I will start with you, uh, if you don't mind. Thank you for making time for us. Um, and I want you to respond to what I was just saying and the idea that we in the West don't fully appreciate the horror of the nuclear bomb like the Japanese do. Do you think that's true? I think there's a danger that people in the West may trivialize nuclear war. We have computer games and we fight war all the time on a computer screen, not realizing the enormous potential of what could happen if we unleash nuclear fire. Now, some people say, well, is it the scientist's fault? Well, realize that back in the 1930s, it was widely believed that Nazi Germany was ahead of us in terms of developing the nuclear weapons. The greatest atomic scientist of our time, Werner Heisenberg, was in charge of the Nazi atomic bomb project. So uh, naturally, Einstein would write a letter to the President Roosevelt saying that we have to start our own atomic bomb project because, well, the, 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 the Germans are ahead, and who wants a Nazi atomic bomb? But after the war, it became obvious that we had overkill. We had more than enough nuclear weapons to, to fight any adversary. Right now, we have on the order of 30,000 nuclear weapons, enough to destroy all life on the planet Earth. And so we have to realize the consequences of our decisions made way back in the 1930s. Back then, was it justified to build the atomic bomb? I think so. But to carry on the war after, the, after World War II, to create 30,000 tactical and hydrogen bombs, I think was unforgivable. You're a physicist. Talk to me a little bit about your connection with uh, nuclear technology and the journey you've been on, because you've now backed disarmament groups, if I'm uh, correct in thinking. That's correct. Uh, many of my professors were the ones who built the atomic bomb. Uh, Philip Morrison, for example, at MIT, once confided to me that it was his job to assemble piece by piece much of the Nagasaki bomb with his bare hands. There was no manual. There's no book to put together a Nagasaki bomb in those days. He did it with his bare hands. And of course, he justified dropping the atomic bomb on Japan. He said it helped to win the war, but afterwards he became anti-nuclear. Now, when I was in high school, I was chosen by an atomic scientist to work on these things, Edward Teller. Mm. Edward Teller was my mentor throughout my high school and college years. He was the one who pushed forth the hydrogen bomb, a bomb that is a thousand times more powerful than a puny Hiroshima bomb. And he was the one who helped to build the arsenal and went head to head with the Soviet Union. And so you begin to realize there was a split, a split in the scientific community. Many scientists would privately believe in the work of Oppenheimer, who had doubts about this nuclear proliferation, but the Pentagon was gung-ho in terms of grabbing at every single nuclear straw they could get their hands on. Thank you for giving us that context. Let's cross now to our other guests joining this conversation. Coming to you, Tim, uh, also joining us down the line. Um, and I brought up the recent Russian threat. It's not the first, and it's certainly probably not going to be the last, unfortunately. As a military man, how concerned are you by the recent Russia threat? And do you think the public is paying enough attention? I don't think we're paying enough attention, the public in the round. It is a serious threat. I think it's pretty improbable, but nonetheless, uh, it is possible. And we need to remember that, well, mostly when we talk about nuclear weapons, we talk about strategic nuclear exchange, what we used to call in the Cold War days, mutually assured destruction. And those numbers that the professor were talking about were very much a, a part of that. Uh, and, the, you know, the huge numbers that we had in place at the time. There have since been strategic arms limitation talks, but those have broken down recently. Uh, but the other end of the spectrum is tactical nuclear weapons. And these are, are small, relatively small nuclear weapons that can be fired from artillery and rockets and, and indeed dropped from airplanes and so forth. And they have a, an effect on a battlefield rather than taking out major cities and so forth with the strategic nuclear exchange would be, we would be talking about. These are battlefield weapons that will destroy 
you know, large numbers of people over a relatively small area, but nonetheless a significant area. And Putin's threat to use them is linked to the fact that he's not winning the conventional war in Ukraine. He's worried, I think, about losing the provinces in, that he's gained so far. And the key issue, the one that I think most psychologically is important to him, is the Crimea. If Ukraine looked like they were going to take, retake the Crimea, which from a Russian perspective, and I don't agree with it, but nonetheless, we need to understand the Russian perspective here. The Russian perspective is that Crimea is part of Russia. And therefore, if they were to lose Crimea and things were turning really bad and the conventional war was not going well, then it is possible that Putin could order the use of tactical nuclear weapons. Mm. Now, would his generals can carry that out? What's the chain of command? I mean, I know a little bit about it, but the chain of command to actually fire these weapons, you know, how robust is that, mm. is another issue altogether. And as you, say, is... as you say, Tim, it, it's sort of almost a concession at this point that there is a counteroffensive that is some way to succeed. And look, I want to come and bring Carol into this conversation now. She's been sitting in the studio listening to this. A strategic nu nuclear exchange, or mutually assured destruction, as we talked about in the past, um, when you hear the argument for it, we're currently at war. Uh, what do you say to the public that, you know, to convince them that we don't need nuclear weapons? I say, first of all, that these so-called small tactical nuclear weapons are many, many times more powerful than the atom bomb dropped on Hiroshima or Nagasaki, and therefore don't be fooled by the terminology. These are developed, being developed by the United States and by other countries. They, the war in Ukraine is actually a confrontation between two nuclear powers. Russia on the one hand, NATO with the nuclear armory of the USA behind it on the other. So let us not talk about continuing the war, which is 99% of information, I would say propaganda, that we get on British television and across Western Europe. In fact, there is an incredible danger of the war sp spiralling out of hand. The latest information, which most British people have not been made aware of, is that US nuclear weapons are coming to Britain as part of the NATO forces in Europe. They're going to be stationed in Lake and Heath, which is about 70 miles northeast of the capital in Suffolk. It, if that puts us on the front line, were they to be used, then the whole of Britain, the whole of the British Isles would be um, devastated by it. And of course, of course, the fact that they're there, whether they're used or not, makes mm. us a front line, a threat, a front line. So my, my final sentence is to everyone who's watching is please be very, very afraid. Do not listen to the propaganda that nuclear weapons mm. are small, they will be used in a battlefield. This is not true. So you are very much obviously reinforcing the idea that we need to get wise about the real risk of nuclear weapons. I want to come back to Tim though and talk a little bit about, we do have them, they are there. In terms of, I know you speak on behalf of disarmament, but Tim, when we think about policy and the way politicians use nuclear weapons, that's a big issue that is brought up within the movie Oppenheimer, uh, which obviously is based in real life. Uh, interesting statistics, six in 10 Americans are uncomfortable with the president having the sole authority to authorize the use of nuclear weapons. Do you think politicians can be trusted with nukes? And if not, who should be? Well, I don't think anybody can be trusted with nukes, uh, but whether we like it much or not, we live in a democratic society. We elect our politicians and ultimately, the other alternative would be to have the military in charge, and that's not a clever solution either. So I'm afraid we're stuck with the fact that politicians do have to have the authority uh, and the responsibility and therefore the accountability to decide whether to use these weapons or not. Now, you know, again, I, I understand what the, what the lady is saying, and I'm not a, a, a great fan of, of strategic nuclear weapons at all. But nonetheless, we do need to understand the distinction between these things. It, it is... I'm afraid she's not correct in saying it is not true that they are different. These are escalatory weapons that can be used in different ways 
under the deterrence, strategic deterrence theory and so forth that we all used to know so well back in the Cold War years. But at the end of the day, to, you know, again, to focus back in on your question, who else do you want to be in charge of this? We're not going to disinvent these things. They are around. Uh, what we need to have in place is the ability to ensure that we deter the use of these weapons by the ability uh, to stand firm against people like Putin. I mean, in, in the introductory uh, comments by the professor, quite rightly, he raised the whole issue of the threat of Germany uh, having a nuclear weapon. I've got no doubt at all that if Hitler had had access to nuclear weapons, he would have used them in 1945. So, you know, we have to recognize, and I've, I've been on operations against people like, um, you know, Milosevic and Saddam Hussein and all the other hoods who are, you know, dangerous, nasty people in the world. We can't be naive about this. Mm. So it has to be, I think, in that at the end of the day, in the hands of politicians. Now, the command chain and who who gathers around within the political world to make those decisions. You know, that's another issue. I want should to it off just be the prime minister or should it be the cabinet or, you know, whomever else? Is I want a fair to question to ask. offer the final um, thoughts to Dr. Kaku joining us from the US uh, because he set up this debate so well and gave us that important context mentored, as you said, by Teller himself, which, of course, was a, a character, well, who was personified within the movie. Um, look, Dr. Kaku, you think a lot about the future. When you think about the future from here with regards to the nuclear threat and how we handle this strategic nuclear exchange, what do you see? Well, in the short term, of course, we have the theory of deterrence, using nuclear weapons to deter the enemy from using nuclear weapons. But I think we have to go beyond that. I think we have to look at the question of disarmament. Now, we're not talking about a pie in the sky. We're talking about real life conflicts. We don't want people like Putin to threaten <laughs> other people with tactical nuclear weapons. Because once it starts, how do you stop it? It's easy to start a nuclear war, but how do you stop a nuclear war once it's in progress? Once you lose Washington, once you lose Moscow, at what point do you stop? So even though a small tactical exchange could be very bad, it could easily escalate to a full-fledged confrontation with strategic nuclear weapons. And so I think that beyond deterrence, we have to begin honest, realistic discussions of disarmament, or else we will have more Putins in the future declaring that they will settle their ancient grudge matches with nuclear weapons. Doctor, Carol, Tim, thank you all very much for a really interesting discussion.